The 613 Commandments, Part 2. The purpose of our study is to look at a representative sample of Torah commandments to see how they would apply to Christians today prior to the coming of God's Millennial Kingdom. The next commandment on our list, number 31, remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. Exodus chapter 20 verse 8 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This commandment applies to everyone. It applied equally to Israelites and resident aliens living in the land of Israel. The general nature of this commandment is confirmed by the fact that God sanctified the seventh-day Sabbath at creation for all humanity. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. And thus God gave the seventh-day Sabbath to Adam and Eve at creation, and that extended to all of their children, to all of humanity. The universal nature of the Sabbath commandment is confirmed in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, where Jesus said to the Israelites, The Sabbath was made for man. That is, God created it for the benefit of all of humanity. Notice that Jesus said, The Sabbath was made for man. He did not say that the Sabbath was made for Israel. The Sabbath was intended for all of the children of Adam and Eve. The next commandment on our list, number 32, don't work on the Sabbath. Exodus chapter 20, verse 10 says, But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. In this passage we see that the Sabbath applied to everyone living in the land of Israel, to Israelites and to resident aliens alike. It applied to everyone. In fact, God promises to bless Gentiles who love him and keep his Sabbath holy. In Isaiah chapter 56, verse 6, And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. So again we see that from the beginning God intended that Israelites and Gentiles should keep the seventh-day Sabbath, that this is a general command for all mankind. The next command, number 33, honor your parents. Exodus chapter 20 verse 12 says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Again, this is a general law that applies to everyone. The universal nature of this law is confirmed by the fact that Paul taught Jewish and Gentile Christians to obey this command. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, Paul wrote, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. The promise that Paul is referring to in this passage is that your days may be prolonged. In other words, that the children might have long life. When children honor their parents and obey them, and the parents teach the children proper godly principles, they have a tendency to avoid sin, which produces sickness, suffering, misery, sorrow, and an early death. Commandment number 34 on our list, don't commit murder. Exodus chapter 20 verse 13 says, you shall not murder. Again, this command applies to everyone. It applied equally to Israelites and resident aliens living in the land of Israel. The universal nature of this commandment 
is confirmed by the fact that Peter taught Jewish and Gentile Christians to obey this command. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15, make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. This commandment prohibits the unlawful taking of human life, but there are Torah exceptions to this command. It is permissible to take life when executing a criminal who deserves the death penalty, or in self-defense, or to come to the aid of another who is in mortal danger. Commandment number 35 on our list, don't commit adultery. Exodus chapter 20 verse 14 says, you shall not commit adultery. Again, this command applies to everyone. It applied to anyone, Israelite or resident alien, living in the land of Israel. The universal nature of this command is again confirmed by the fact that Paul taught Jewish and Gentile Christians to obey this command. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Paul wrote, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. So here Paul clearly lists sexual immorality as a reason why people will not inherit the kingdom of God. Commandment number 36, don't steal. Exodus chapter 20 verse 15 says, you shall not steal. This command again applied to everyone, Israelite or resident alien living in the land of Israel. The general nature of this command is also confirmed by the fact that Paul taught Jewish and Gentile Christians to obey this command. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28, Paul wrote, He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Command number 37, don't bear false witness. Exodus chapter 20 verse 16 says, You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This command, again, would have applied equally to Israelites and resident aliens living in the land of Israel. The universal nature of this command is again confirmed by the fact that Paul taught Jewish and Gentile Christians to obey this command. Notice in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Our next command, number 38, don't covet. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17 says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This command, again, applied to everyone, Israelite or resident alien, living in the land of Israel. And the universal nature of this law is confirmed by the fact that Paul taught Jewish and Gentile Christians to obey it. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, Paul wrote, For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, that is, an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So breaking this commandment is a serious offense that can keep one out of the kingdom of God. Command number 39 now, don't make silver or gold idols. In Exodus chapter 20 verse 23, you shall not make other gods besides me. Gods of silver or gods of gold you shall not make for yourselves. This law again applied to everyone, Israelite or resident alien, living in the land of Israel, because no foreign gods were permitted anywhere in the land of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, Moses wrote, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. The God of Israel does not tolerate any rivals. 
The universal nature of this command is again confirmed by the fact that Paul taught Jewish and Gentile Christians to obey it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, again we read, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters. So once again we see that idolatry is a very serious sin. It is so serious that it can keep one from inheriting the kingdom of God. The next command on our list, number 40, don't make an altar out of hewn stones. Exodus chapter 20, verse 25 says, If you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it out of cut stones. For if you wield your tool on it, you will profane it. Now this commandment specifically applies to the people of Israel. God authorized only one altar to be built, and only one nation was ever allowed to build an altar to the Lord, and that is the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 13 says, Be careful that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every cultic place you see, but in the place which the Lord chooses in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings and there you shall do all that I command you. Again, in Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 12, Has not the same Hezekiah taken away his, that is, God's high places and his altars, and said to Judah and Jerusalem, You shall worship before one altar, and on it you shall burn incense. And so God only authorized one place for an altar to exist where he would be worshipped. And that altar was to be built by the Israelites following these specifications and requirements. The next commandment, number 41, don't climb steps to the altar. Exodus chapter 20, verse 26 says, And you shall not go up by steps to my altar, so that your nakedness will not be exposed on it. This command only applied to the priests of ancient Israel, who would offer the sacrifices and burnt offerings on the altar. To go up to the altar to make these sacrifices, they walked up a ramp with a gentle incline. They would not walk up by steps because they were wearing loose-fitting garments, an ephod and a robe, and if they raised their legs in order to climb up steps, the inside or the interior of their garments might be exposed. So here in this commandment, we see God teaching the children of Israel principles of proper modesty. Exodus chapter 28, verse 43 says, Make linen undergarments to cover their bare flesh, that is, the priests, extending from the waist to the thigh. Aaron and his sons must wear them whenever they enter the tent of meeting or approach the altar to minister in the holy place so that they will not incur guilt and die. This is to be a permanent statute for Aaron and his descendants. The fact that God wants his people to exercise proper modesty is reflected in Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 23. Paul wrote, And the parts we consider less honorable we treat with greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with special modesty, whereas our presentable parts have no such need. So here in this commandment, we see that God is teaching the children of Israel principles of proper modesty. The next law, number 42, Israelite bond servants to go free after six years of service. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 2, If you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve you for six years but on the seventh he shall go out as a free man without payment. This command is a civil command that applies to the nation of Israel, but the principle here is an example for other nations. You see, in ancient Israel, destitute Israelites paid their debts through a system of indentured servitude. We would say that they became contract workers. The maximum term of their contract 
could be no more than six years. If the value of their debt was beyond or greater than six years of service, all remaining debts were canceled at the end of the six years. There were no Victorian debtor prisons in ancient Israel. You would work to pay off as much of your debt as you owed for six years, and after that, your debts were canceled. So again, this is a civil law that applied specifically for the children of Israel living in the land of Israel. Christians today should follow the laws of their particular nation. But there is wisdom here in having people work off as much of their debt as they can, and if the debt is greater than they can bear beyond six years, to cancel and to release the remaining portion of that debt. Thus, Israelites were encouraged not to borrow too much money, not to borrow money beyond which they could easily pay back. But if some Israelite did get into trouble by getting into debt way over their heads, God had a system of releasing them after six years and canceling all of the remaining debt. So there was a balance between the debtor and the creditor. The next command, number 43, Israelite maidservants must be redeemed. Exodus chapter 21 verse 7 says, If a man sells his daughter as a female slave, she is not to go free as the male slaves do. If she is displeasing in the eyes of her master, who designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He does not have authority to sell her to a foreign people because of his unfairness to her. This command specifically applied to ancient Israelites living in the land of Israel, but there are principles of justice here that serve as an example for other nations. In ancient Israel, if a family became destitute, the daughters were effectively married off in order to prevent them from starving to death. But the arrangement had to be mutually agreeable to both parties. In ancient Israel, arranged marriages were the norm. Today, modern Western cultures have developed social welfare programs that eliminated the need for customs like this. But in their day, they served a specific purpose, to prevent people from starving to death if they became destitute. Commandment number 44, Israelite maidservants have betrothal rights. Exodus chapter 21 verse 9 says, If he designates her, that is the Israelite maidservant, for his son, he shall deal with her according to the custom of daughters. Again, this command only applies to Israel. However, there are principles in this command that serve as an example for others. In ancient Israel, the father of the bridegroom would pay the bride price to the father of the girl and, from that point forward, would take on the responsibility of providing the food, clothing, and shelter for his future daughter-in-law until the son and the daughter-in-law were old enough to get married. Even in an arranged marriage in ancient Israel, the daughter had rights. A marriage had to be mutually agreeable or she had ways that she could get out of it. These customs may seem foreign to us today because we are not used to arranged marriages. But in ancient Israel, this was a way for children, especially the daughters, to escape grinding poverty and to find a better life in their culture and in their community. Commandment number 45 is related to this. Israelite maidservants can't be sold to foreigners. Exodus chapter 21 verse 7 says, If a man sells his daughter as a female slave, she is not to go free as male slaves do. If she is displeasing in the eyes of her master, who designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He does not have authority to sell her to a foreign people because of his unfairness to her. So again, this command specifically applies to Israel, but it contains some principles of justice that apply to all people. God was very concerned with keeping believers together as one family, but 
he did not want Israelites to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3, Moses wrote, There shall be no marriages between Israel and Canaanites, that is, foreigners who don't believe in the God of Israel. This principle is repeated in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 17, where Paul commanded Christians to have no fellowship with unbelievers and not to be unequally yoked with them. This would preclude marriages to unbelievers. So we see this principle of staying clear of fellowship with unbelievers repeated in the New Testament. Commandment number 46, Israelite maidservants have marital rights. Exodus chapter 21 verse 10 says, If he takes to himself another woman, that is, another wife, he may not reduce her food, her clothing, or her conjugal rights. This law applied specifically to ancient Israelites living in the land of Israel. But there are principles here that we can learn from today. If a husband decided to take on a second wife, he was required to provide support and children to each wife equally. There could be no discrimination within the family. The Apostle Paul acknowledged the fact that husbands and wives have conjugal duties to each other. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, Paul wrote, Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer, and come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Here, the Apostle Paul is telling married couples that they should not deprive one another sexually, except for a very short period of time when they want to devote themselves to fasting and prayer. Then they should come back together again as a married couple, so that Satan would not tempt them. Commandment number 47, execute anyone who strikes or curses a parent. Exodus chapter 21 verse 15 says, He who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Exodus chapter 21 verse 17 says, He who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. This command specifically applied to Israel, but there are principles here that we can learn from. This particular command is a civil law that was to guide Israelite judges in the cases that they would decide. But it is also an example for other nations to emulate. This commandment is not talking about a three-year-old throwing a temper tantrum. This is talking about a teenager or a young adult who rises up and curses and strikes his parents, physically assaulting them. The fact that striking a parent or cursing a parent is a death penalty offense is confirmed by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, where he described the kinds of sins that were rampant in the Gentile world. In Romans chapter 1, verse 29, he wrote, Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So here the Apostle Paul confirms the fact that rising up in rebellion against parents, cursing them and striking them, is a deed worthy of death. But again, this is a civil law that guided Israelite judges in the land of Israel. Today, Christians are not living in a theocracy. We live in individual countries that have different laws and different customs, and Christians must abide by the laws of whatever nation they find themselves in. Commandment number 48, execute a kidnapper. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 16, he who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or he is found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. 
Again, this law specifically applied to the nation of Israel and served as an example for the Gentile nations. This is a civil law that was to guide Israelite judges in making decisions and rendering verdicts, but it serves as an example for other nations to emulate. Christians today, living in individual countries, have to follow the laws of their particular nation. But the principle is valid. This is underscored by what Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men, and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. So we see here that Paul lists kidnapping as a sin that needed to be outlawed because it was evil. In God's system of justice, kidnapping was a death penalty offense. Commandment number 49, financial liability for injury to another. Exodus chapter 21 verse 18 says, If men are quarreling and one strikes the other with a stone or a fist, and he does not die but is confined to bed, then the one who struck him shall go unpunished, as long as the other can get up and walk around outside with his staff. Nevertheless, he must compensate the man for his lost work and see that he is completely healed. Again, this command specifically applied to the nation of Israel, but it serves as an example for the Gentile nations. This was a civil law that would guide Israelite judges in rendering decisions and verdicts in civil cases. The net effect of this law would be to discourage people from fighting if they knew that there might be financial consequences for getting into a brawl. Commandment number 50, punish anyone who kills his slave. Exodus chapter 21 verse 20 says, If a man strikes his male or female slave with a rod and he dies at his hand, he shall be punished. However, if the slave gets up after a day or two, the owner shall not be punished since the slave is his property. Again, this law applied specifically to ancient Israel living in the promised land, but it serves as an example for others. This law specifically applied to foreign-born slaves who usually were prisoners of war or common criminals that became slaves in the land of Israel. It did not apply to Israelite indentured servants. There were no prisons in ancient Israel, and so when someone purchased a slave, he was essentially becoming a prison warden, and order had to be maintained within society. So this is a civil law that would guide Israelite judges in rendering verdicts in cases where an individual beat a slave and that slave died. There was to be punishment, but it was not necessarily the death penalty. Commandment number 51, kill an animal that kills a human. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 28, we read, If an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall surely be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall go unpunished. This commandment applied to everyone living in Israel, whether they were an Israelite or a resident alien. Anyone who owned an ox would know that oxen have a tendency to push with their horns and they are dangerous creatures. So, the owner of an ox would generally build a pen or some kind of fenced enclosure in order to keep the ox away from other human beings. If someone was foolish enough to climb into a field or a pen with an ox and they got injured, they were basically responsible for their own death by doing something foolish. So this is a civil law to guide Israelite judges in rendering a decision about blood guilt with respect to an accident that occurred with an ox. But the principle of killing the animal goes back as far as Noah. 
In Genesis chapter 9, verse 5, God said, And surely I will require the life of any man or beast by whose hand your lifeblood is shed. I will demand an accounting from anyone who takes the life of his fellow man. So here we see that if a beast kills a human being, the life of that animal is forfeit. Commandment number 52, don't eat the flesh of an animal that killed a human being. Exodus 21 verse 28 says, If an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall surely be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall go unpunished. Again, this commandment applied specifically to ancient Israel, but it serves as an example for us today. This was a civil law to guide Israelite judges when they rendered decisions about criminal and civil liability. The animal had to die, and the flesh of the animal could not be eaten. So the owner of the ox got no benefit from the dead animal. This would have provided incentive for the owner of an ox to build a fence or a pen around his ox to keep people away from the ox, lest he should lose his valuable ox. Commandment number 53, financial liability for negligent harm to an animal. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 33, Moses wrote, If a man opens a pit or digs a pit and does not cover it over, and an ox or a donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make restitution. He shall give money to its owner and the dead animal shall become his. This command specifically applied to ancient Israel, living in the Promised Land, but it serves as an example for us today. It is another example of a civil law that was to guide Israelite judges in rendering legal verdicts. If someone were to dig a pit, they were required to cover it over and thus protect their neighbors from harm. This commandment teaches us the principle that people are responsible for the safety and well-being of others, even of other people's animals. This is reflected in the commandment given in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 and 18, which teach us to love our neighbors as ourself. If we truly love our neighbor as ourself, we would cover the pit to protect them from danger. Commandment number 54, punishments for stealing. In Exodus chapter 22, verse 1, Moses wrote, If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall pay five oxen for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. If the thief is caught while breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there will be no blood guiltiness on his account. But if the sun has risen on him, there will be blood guiltiness on his account. He shall surely make restitution, if he owns nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If what he stole is actually found alive in his possession, whether an ox or a donkey or a sheep, he shall pay double. So again, this is a civil command that applied specifically to the nation of Israel living in the promised land, and it serves as an example for other nations to follow. This principle is reflected in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 30, Men do not despise the thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger. Yet, if he is caught, he must pay sevenfold, and he must give up all the wealth of his house. So, it is true that sometimes people are driven by desperation to steal. Even so, that does not absolve them of punishment for their crimes. Everyone has a moral choice to make when they are in tough times. Society has an obligation to help people who are poor, and the poor have an obligation to avoid resorting to stealing in order to get what they want. Commandment number 55, financial liability for negligent harm to property. In Exodus 22, verse 6, Moses wrote, If a fire breaks out and spreads to thorn bushes, so that stacked grain, or the standing grain, or the field itself is consumed, he who started the fire shall surely make restitution. 
Again, this is another civil law to guide ancient Israelite judges in rendering decisions in civil matters, and it was a law that applied to the nation of Israel living in the Promised Land. But the principles here can teach us about justice. In Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 and 18, we see that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. If we harm our neighbor by setting a fire to our field and it spreads to the neighbor's field, we have a duty and responsibility to make our neighbor financially whole. If we cause someone else to suffer financial loss, we must make that debt up to our neighbor. So here in this commandment, God was teaching the ancient Israelites the concept of personal responsibility. Commandment number 56, financial liability if stolen property is recovered. In Exodus chapter 22, verse 7, Moses wrote, If a man gives his neighbor money or goods to keep for him, and it is stolen from the man's house, if the thief is caught, that thief shall pay double. Again, this is a civil law that was designed for the nation of Israel living in the promised land, but it serves as an example for us today. The neighbor who held the property wasn't responsible for guarding it. The owner who lent the property to his neighbor was assuming the risk. In Exodus chapter 22, verse 4, we see that if what he stole is actually found alive in his possession, whether an ox or a donkey or a sheep, the thief shall pay double. So this principle of paying back double when they were caught is found in two places. Commandment number 57, criminal liability if guarding a neighbor's property. Exodus 22 verse 8 says, If the thief is not caught, then the owner of the house shall appear before the judges to determine whether he laid his hands on his neighbor's property. Again, this is a civil law that specifically applied to the nation of Israel living in the promised land, but it serves as an example for us today. God was teaching the Israelites the principle of criminal investigation. The judges were to seek out the facts of this case in order to determine who the guilty party was. Thus, cases were to be decided on the basis of evidence after careful criminal investigation. Commandment number 58, the judges shall decide all property disputes. Exodus chapter 22, verse 9, for every breach of trust, whether it is for ox, for donkey, for sheep, for clothing, or for any lost thing about which one says, this is it, the case of both parties shall come before the judges. He whom the judges condemn shall pay double to his neighbor. This, again, is a civil command that applies specifically to the nation of Israel living in the promised land, but again serves as an example for us today. Through this commandment, God was teaching the ancient Israelites the principle of lex rex, that is, the rule of law. In ancient Israel, they had a tendency for every man to do what was right in his own sight, that is, every man set himself up as his own lord and judge. But that is not how a civilized society is supposed to function. Cases should be decided by neutral, objective third parties who are appointed as judges to render fair and impartial verdicts. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 18, Moses commanded the children of Israel, Appoint judges in every town. They shall judge fairly. So by taking the judgment out of the hands of the two disputing parties and settling it by the hands of the judges appointed within Israel, they could obtain objective, fair, and balanced verdicts. Thus, God was teaching the ancient Israelites the principle of the rule of law. Commandment number 59, financial liability for borrowed property. Here, in Exodus chapter 22, verse 14, Moses wrote, If a man borrows anything from his neighbor, and it is injured or dies, while its owner is not with it, the man who borrowed it shall make full restitution. If its owner was with it, he shall not make restitution. If it is hired, 
that is rented out, it came for its hire. Again, this is a civil law that applied to the ancient nation of Israel in the Promised Land, but the principles here are relevant for us today. Through this commandment, God was teaching the ancient Israelites the concept of personal responsibility and risk management. If a person was foolish enough to lend his neighbor an ox or a donkey for doing work, he should have hired it out at a rental price so that he could insure himself against the loss of the animal. And separately, if he really wanted to make sure that the person who was borrowing the tool or animal was not abusing it, the owner of that animal or tool could stay with it and watch how it was used to make sure it was not being abused. Again, people needed to take personal responsibility for the things that they owned and take personal responsibility for managing risk if they lent those items out. Commandment number 60, Financial Liability for Seducing a Maiden. In Exodus chapter 22, verse 16, Moses wrote, If a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged and lies with her, he must pay a dowry for her to be his wife. If her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the dowry for virgins. Again, this is a civil law that applied to the ancient Israelites living in the Promised Land. But there are principles here that we can learn from today. In ancient societies, there was no way to be cured of sexually transmitted diseases. Thus, society placed a very high value on virginity. Once a girl lost her virginity, there was not likely to be another suitor to take her in marriage. And so, if two young people wandered off alone and they got involved and went too far, this situation could only be remedied in one of two ways. First, the dowry would have to be paid in order to provide for the girl's support if she decided to return to her father's house. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 28, we see, If a man finds a girl who is a virgin, who is not engaged, and seizes her and lies with her, and they are discovered, then the man who lay with her shall give the girl's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall become his wife, because he has violated her. He cannot divorce her all his days. Thus the bride price was fifty shekels. Fifty shekels was a very high price in ancient Israel. It was worth the value of a male slave in the prime of his life, as we see in Leviticus chapter 27, verses 1 through 8. And so the outcome of this unfortunate situation was that the girl and the boy would get married and the boy would have to pay the girl's father the bride price. Thus, young men in Israel were financially incentivized to behave themselves prior to getting married. And if they got into trouble, the situation could be resolved. If the young couple liked each other, they could get married. But if they were not suitable for each other, if there was some kind of a problem in the relationship, the girl did not have to stay with the boy. Yet he had to provide for her financial support for the rest of his life. Fifty shekels of silver would have maintained that girl in a very comfortable lifestyle for the rest of her days. Thus, young men in Israel were financially incentivized to behave themselves prior to marriage.